Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Saturday's launch of NROL 71 on board a Delta IV Heavy brought, of course, the usual spectacular Delta Fireball and Rocket, but it also brought a return of the onboard camera for daytime launches. We had previously seen the return of the Delta IV Rocket Cam for Parker Solar Probe, but that launched at night. But uh, this is the first time we've seen this in a very, very long time. And, you know, this is a military mission, so it's understandable that the Delta IVs haven't been really running with rocket cams. But I guess ULA sees the power in communicating with rocket fans who, who just love to see this stuff. I mean, in my case, I especially like to see the California coast because it's where I live. We had great weather for it, although it was sufficiently overcast that I wasn't able to see it from my backyard. Prior to Parker Solar Probe, the last rocket cam I could find on a Delta IV was from 2007, and that was a trademarked rocket cam by Ecliptic Systems. But, you know, this time we got to see it once again flying, and, you know, we get to see stage separation, which is, of course, fantastic. And we saw that on Parker Solar Probe, but what we didn't see on Parker Solar Probe was the second stage, because Parker Solar Probe was, of course, trying to achieve the maximum escape velocity possible, because it was going into a very, very hard-to-reach orbit. So they stripped off... Well, I mean, they wouldn't even have included it because they would have left it off of the design. But yeah, they didn't have it on the second stage, so we didn't get to see this really cool thing happening. And this happens on every Delta launch, but if you look up there, that is the second stage engine, the RL-10, having its nozzle extension rolled into place. Here's an unstretched version. I think the original rocket cam was in 4 to 3 aspect ratio and they just went and squished the 16 to 9 into that. So this looks more like the real thing. But what's going on there is there's an extra kind of cone-shaped section that is rolled over the end of the nozzle and that increases the exit area and therefore improves the engine efficiency. The lighting isn't perfect, so actually I went back to that 2007 video, which is in glorious like 360p resolution, but that is lit by infrared LEDs or whatever, so the camera does get to see a little more of what's going on. So the nozzle extension is a graphite ablative material, it's very lightweight, it isn't actively cooled, and there's the staging happen, and then watch the screws, so those are electrically actu actuated like screws that roll the thing down and then it locks in place at the bottom. And once it's down, the engine can start and benefit from the extra performance. The RL-10 has a long history. It was first flown in 1962, and it currently powers the upper stage of both the Atlas and the Delta IV. However, it, they're not exactly the same kind of engine, or at least they weren't until recently. The RL-10A-1 was the first version flown on a single mission in the 1960s, and it was immediately replaced by the A-3, which kind of became the standard right through to the start of or the mid-1990s. Uh, it generated a thrust of about 67 kilonewtons. Initially, the specific impulse was about 420, rising up to about 450 by the time uh, it, its career was over. But the development of the Atlas II led to a new version of the RL-10, the RL-10 A-4, surprisingly. And for that, they managed to bump the thrust up to about 90 uh, kilonewtons and get, uh, you know, specific impulse again in the same area. And this first flew in 1995. And around this time, McDonnell Douglas was looking for a successor to their Delta II, which had a an upper stage which ran on uh, hypergolic fuels rather than this fancy new hydrogen-oxygen stuff. So they got Aerojet Rocket Design to design an engine just for their Delta. That would be the RL-10-B with the extendable nozzle. This brought the specific impulse up to the 460s and the thrust up to over 110 kilonewtons. The Atlas was unable to benefit from this extra nozzle length because it still offered a dual engine variant. But there had been a few other improvements made, and the version that flies on the Atlas V was known as the, the A-4-2. But when the ULA was created and Delta and Atlas both ended up under the same roof, there was understandably some incentive for them to merge their engine designs. Prior to the creation of ULA, Boeing had apparently placed a rather large order for the 10B variant engines, and so the decision was made about 10 years ago that these would be modified and merged to create the glorious future of the ULA, the RL-10C, which is rather convenient because they can say that the C stands for common. 
But going forward, the RL10C is the version that's going to be used in pretty much all the future projects, including SLS, Vulcan, and Omega. And in the process, Aerojet is trying to bring the cost and complexity down. Ma making those engine bells is really complicated because it pretty much involves brazing all these tubes together. They're starting to look at 3D printing parts, additive manufacturing. They tested a version with a 3D printed copper tr uh, thrust chamber. And supposedly that reduces the part count in the engine by 90%. The thrust chamber is probably the most critical component on an RL10 engine because it is an expander cycle engine. The way the engine works is they pump you know, cryogenic liquid hydrogen into the walls of the thrust chamber while the engine is burning. That uh, then boils and the boiled off hydrogen is used to drive the turbines which drive the pumps which then pump more fuel into the engine. And this basically keeps the engine running and it's very, very efficient. The highest efficiency, the highest specific impulse of any chemical engine is the RL10. I guess while I'm here, I should also mention the common extensible cryogenic engine, which was a development program by NASA to develop a deep throttling version of the RL-10. The idea is they wanted to use it for landing on the moon using the, in the Altair program. And there's a fantastic video of this online. So, Obviously, inside a rocket engine is incredibly hot and outside is incredibly cold. And this is a great video showing this because they actually have ice forming. Icicles are forming at the engine output. They were able to throttle the uh, CC from something like 8% to over 100%. And it, as they would throttle down, the amount of heat coming out would be sufficient that, or would leave enough room for the ice to start forming the outside of the bell. It really is rather beautiful when you consider that inside that flame, pretty much any structural metal will melt or even boil. Uh, and a few inches away, a few centimetres, we just have ice forming because the exhaust gases are so optically thin that they don't emit much light. Most of the energy is just going into the kinetic energy of the exhaust, and that's why icicles can exist in this environment. I think it's one of the most beautiful demonstrations in rocket engineering. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.